Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. We are learning more details about the investigation into the deadly incident on the set of Alec Baldwin's new movie. A search warrant executed by the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office is revealing that an assistant director handed Baldwin one of three prop guns on the set, which may have contained a live round. According to the affidavit, police seized all of the weapons, cameras, and computer equipment following the incident. The gun, fired by Baldwin, hit and killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins in the chest. Director Joel Souza, who was behind Hutchins, hit in the shoulder, was later treated and released from an Albuquerque hospital. Joining me to discuss this tragic incident and give us some insight into how this could have happened is Dutch Merrick. He is a prop master and the former president of the union IATSE Local 44. And in addition to his film and TV work, Dutch Merrick has also worked on over 500 commercials as a prop master or art director. Dutch, thank you so much for making time for us this afternoon. Good morning, Julie. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, we really want to tap into your expertise. So kind of taking it from the top, being a prop master, uh, what are your responsibilities when it comes to safety on a set, please? Well, you know, prop master, we basically deal with any object a director or writer can think of. So it could be a sharp dagger. It could be uh, anything you can imagine, really. And within that category can be firearms or a motorcycle, perhaps, things that can be potentially very hazardous. So we break down the script. We decide what that thing is going to be. We provide it to the set. We lock it up. If it's a firearm, we keep it under lock and key in a safe. Uh, it stays in our custody until we're ready to rehearse the scene and then film the scene. And it's either a prop master or what we call an armorer would handle the firearms. And that goes directly to the actor. The first assistant director will get a chance to observe, uh, look at the guns to make sure they're empty or safe or what we call cold. And then uh, they can block a, or rehearse a scene perhaps with a gun uh, or a dummy gun. And then when we get ready to film, once we've blocked it out and we know where everyone's going to be standing, where the cameras are, where the lights are, then we show the actor where to point the gun in a, in a safe direction. And then at that point, once everything's ready, the very last thing, we load the gun with blanks with the number of blanks we're going to fire in the scene and we give it to the actor and then we move out, they film the scene and then we're the very first ones in to secure the gun after the scene and declare the gun cold. So we'll empty it at that point and take it off the set. Dutch, this is also helpful. Um, let's start with prop guns, if we can, please. I want to unpack some of what you just shared with us. Sure. Educating us, is it correct that there are different kinds of prop guns, fake guns or real firearms that will just uh, fire a blank, as you mentioned? Yeah, there's a variety of, of, of guns or things that look like guns that we use. Hollywood goes back over 100 years using actual firearms for props. They've been making studio blanks from since the 1920s, and they've been proven safe again and again. There's also other alternatives, uh, such as what they call non-guns that fire an electronic charge, a little pyrotechnic, and then airsoft guns, which uh, some uh, uh, young gun enthusiasts use uh, for entertainment. We can use those in a pinch, but generally speaking, we try for the realism that helps create the realistic environment for the actor, and we use real guns whenever possible. If it's in a stunt, we may use a rubber version of a gun. So our special effects team will mold from a real gun something that looks uh, absolutely identical. And so there may be a scene where uh, an actor comes in and fires two shots and then someone wrestles it from their hand. In the middle of filming that sequence, we'll shoot it in pieces. So one will be a real gun and we'll stop the camera, we'll put in a rubber gun and then they throw it to the ground. Uh, so there's a variety of different things that are actual guns or look just like the guns that we use in the process. So Dutch, if you're using a prop gun, that is an actual firearm that can um, fire a typical cartridge or a round as they're called. I know typically a component, you know, the components of a cartridge, you're going to have your casing, your primer, your powder, your projectile, right? Is the projectile yes. the only thing that's missing? And by that, I mean, you know, the bullet uh, would be missing with a blank. Yes. Uh, an easy way to tell most blanks from a regular bullet is rather than seeing the copper bullet on the end or a lead bullet on the end, the end of the casing actually looks sort of like the end of a hot dog or a sausage. It's been crimped down. It's been pressed down. And it's pretty obvious the difference between a live round and a blank. There are blanks that uh, look like an open casing, but they'll have a little 
cardboard, a little circle of cardboard that holds the powder in place, and that burns up as it shoots out the barrel. Now, a blank gun uh, can be dangerous 20 feet out of the barrel, out of the muzzle. It shoots fire and flame, and it's all the energy of a real gun, but no projectile. There are varying loads, if we call them. So there, you might have a half load, a full load, a quarter load. And you can use those based on the different situations you'll be filming. If you're closer to a camera, you're closer to another actor, you may go with a smaller load for safety. And then we have a, a gun that is completely plugged, what's called a full plug gun, which nothing can come out of the barrel. It does fire, it does have a round with a very little bit of powder, just enough in a semi-automatic to make it cycle, but there's a complete barrier at the end of the muzzle. So if you put it up to your hand or a piece of paper, it's not, a, not gonna shoot a hole through it. So that's nothing at all comes out the front. So we have everything from full flash and thunder, but no bullet to nothing at all coming out the front. Mm. Dutch, tell me, when you do have um, the muzzle flash naturally coming from the gun, not something that's put into the film in post-production, uh, can that be dangerous, even with a blank? Yeah, it's fire. Uh, if you put a piece of paper a foot in front of a blank gun, it's going to punch a hole through it. So there's a, a, a tremendous amount of energy that comes out the front of, of a gun. If a uh, just a projectile or a rock or a material was lodged in the barrel and you fired a blank behind it, it's going to push it out the barrel with the force of a bullet. This is really something. You know, when we think about how this could have happened in this instance. Um, something you said really made my ears perk up. You said part of the standard practice in you know, turning over a prop gun, making sure that it's safe, has blanks, no live round of ammunition you know, in there ready uh, to be expelled. You, you mentioned pointing it in a downward direction at the ground or something. Can you walk us through what is the protocol to make sure that gun isn't going to expel a projectile? Well, there's essentially three basic rules. We try to narrow it down to make it simple enough everyone can remember the three basic rules of gun safety. And these generally apply to even at a shooting range or a, a regular gun uh, and on a set. And the first of all is you always treat a gun as though it's loaded. Rule number one. Uh, rule number two, you keep the finger off your trigger until you're ready to fire. And you always point the gun in a safe direction. You never point it at another person. So when we're filming a sequence, and an actor is supposed to be pointing a gun at another actor and then the same frame, we actually do something called a cheat. So we will, we will uh, aim the gun slightly toward the camera, but if anything did come out the barrel, it would not hit a person. And that goes with the camera department as well. So a camera traditionally would have two or three people on or around the camera, the operator who's looking through the eyepiece, a focus puller who's who's uh, changing the focal length of the lens as the action happens, possibly a DP or a dolly grip behind the camera. When we do gunfire near the camera or towards the camera, now we have the ability to go with remote control cameras. So they set up the camera, they set up the shot, and people can run the camera from a distance at a remote control monitor. So it makes it much safer. This is really helpful to hear you describing all of this, Dutch, because we know we, we don't have any video of this. We, we haven't seen it firsthand. All we're reading is the reports coming from law enforcement or what has been reported through the media, through people on that set talking, um, what we hear in the 911 call, all of that. Um, tell me, when you hear that the first assistant director uh, touched this prop gun and gave it to Alec Baldwin, according to the facts as we know them, is that something that's out of place or a deviation from the protocol as you typically know it when it comes to safety? Quite honestly, it's something that is just never done in, in film, in Hollywood. It's a, it's a taboo. The first AD is the ultimate arbiter of safety on a set. So if somebody has a set concern of a light that might fall from the ceiling, uh, they can go to the, the AD. If they think that this is a dangerous stunt about to happen, they can go to the AD and he'll get to the bottom of the problem. It all kind of falls on his shoulders. Uh, and the AD will observe the guns, they'll observe the ammo, they have the absolute right to look at the blanks and inspect them, you can inspect the barrel, but it would never handle a gun, would never ever take a gun off of an armorer's cart or a prop person's cart, and, and never in a million years call it clear and say this is a cold gun as they're handing, handing it to an actor. I can see this circumstance happening if somebody's in a big rush and they're putting safety aside, I've never seen it on one of our sets. It's hard to imagine, but we've been trying to 
reconstruct uh, how how could this have happened? And if a guy like you know, and there's a let me just put it this way: there's a conflict. The first AD, the arbiter of safety, is also the one that's driving the bus, who's also trying to get everything filmed on time and get everything happening and moving. So they're driving and driving and trying to get everything done on schedule. And at the same time, they're responsible for safety. Um, might be <laughs> two different jobs there. Right. You know, tell me, with the job of the armor Dutch uh, to set up those prop guns, it's my understanding that person had three of them there on the cart. Um, where might the breakdown, either in communication or in the safety protocol deviation, have occurred? Is there something to indicate that those guns have been checked and cleared to make sure before they're set on a cart? Or can you um, identify anything that's jumping out to you in the facts as we know them with anything that might have been done wrong in the placing of those firearms there within reach of the first AD to, to grab and then hand to Alec Baldwin? Well, it's entirely common for our film crews to work off carts. They, you know, these four-wheel carts we can set out uh, craft service or, or props. And, and armors, we often use these sort of, uh, what they call them, rubber-made carts. And we'll have our, our firearms there stationed at the ready and blank ammunition ready to go. I think this is a question of chain of custody. Uh, the firearms, the props, anything that needs to be secured goes from the safe in the armorer's custody or the prop master's custody onto the cart. It gets wheeled to set. They stay with the cart or the guns at all times. And then that gun, once we decide we're ready to film, then they can load it and hand it to the actor directly. And they'll also coach the actor in where is safe to point the gun. Um, I've choreographed uh, really intricate gun battles where we've had uh, several people with machine guns firing in two directions. And we walk through those scenes very carefully and, and say, okay, you, you're going to fire over here and I'm going to put a piece of tape there so you don't ever fire anything else. Here's a bright piece of orange tape that you can point toward. You over here, you're only going to point toward this and point toward that. And we block everything out. We talk to the camera people. Everyone's comfortable with what they're doing. Everyone knows where their marks are. Only at that point will we go ahead and go to do a take and film a scene and make the guns hot. In Dutch, one point I really want you to underscore, please, if you would, for our viewers, is how commonly prop guns are used. And by prop gun, I mean a, an actual firearm. Um, that can fire off a, a typical cartridge, not one that is a blank uh, that you typically use in movies. And how often are these used and how often are they uh, safely incorporated into movies? What we're looking here at here on the screen is, is a, a still shot from one of Clint Eastwood's movies, and those are real firearms uh, being used. So just one example here in Hollywood where you work, Dutch, and where this happens. What can you tell us about that, please? Well, there's a differentiation uh, between different types of guns and how they function. A revolver, by its nature, you can put a round in the cylinder that goes around, and it will feed anything. You can put a regular bullet in it, you can put a blank in it, and it will feed it into the barrel and fire it. Um, it doesn't require any modification. Uh, a shotgun is like that because it's a manual pump or a lever-action uh, rifle. You can manually put anything into it. It will feed it. Now, a semi-automatic uh, pistol or rifle, uh, works via blowback or gas pressure, those need modification. Generally speaking, there's what we call a plug in the barrel that reduces the diameter of the barrel and causes back pressure so that the action will cycle. If you just put a plain blank in a plain semi-automatic pistol, it will fire once and it will not cycle, it means it will not eject the casing and it will not get the next round into the barrel ready to go. So there are modified guns, semi-automatics, and then there's standard guns like a revolver uh, that will feed anything, essentially. And in Western movies, typically, the revolvers and the rifles are all regular guns that don't require any modification. So they could be fed uh, a blank or a live round. And it's the responsibility of the armor and really the entire film crew to make sure that there's no functional live ammunition around. We have hot blank rounds for sure, but there should never be a real live functional bullet on or near a film set. That is, this incident is such an anomaly to what we do. And, and you asked about how, how much shooting, how much firing, gunfire goes on. Uh, 
millions of rounds, millions with an M of rounds of blank ammunition are manufactured and fired every day for Hollywood. Uh, not millions a day, but they're fired every day, totaling in the millions. Uh, and again, this goes back a hundred years. When I work on a show like SEAL Team, uh, we have all manner of firearms working in a scene and we may have six or seven armorers choreographing a major scene and they could be shooting it overhead from a drone or a helicopter. We could be filming helicopters with 50 caliber machine guns out the side and a bunch of guys on the ground with AK-47s and uh, M4s, what have you, and we do it safely. It's a matter of chain of custody, choreography, everybody knowing their marks and knowing exactly what they're doing. And again, we haven't had a fatality from a firearm on a set in 28 years, and even that was an extreme set of circumstances that allowed that to happen. And are you this referencing is, actor Brandon Lee's death, yes. right? I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted uh, to ask you about that, please, Dutch. Uh, what happened there? Well, as I understand it, uh, there was a revolver. Now, I've heard two versions of the story. I'm going to give you the one that, I, that I've heard the most because uh, I wasn't there. Uh, is that there was a revolver used in a film uh, in, the, in the movie, and they wanted to take some photographs of the, of the actor holding a revolver. And, and they were filming forward, the gun pointing at the camera. And in a revolver, you might imagine the cylinder is sort of open, and you can see the noses of the bullets present in the front of the gun. So if you're going to do a photograph or film with that gun, you want to make it look real, so they put in what are d called dummy rounds. And a dummy run looks just like a full live cartridge, except it has no gunpowder and no primer. And oftentimes for safety, we'll even put a BB in. We'll have a manufacturer with a BB in it so that when you shake it, it rattles. You'll never notice it on camera, but everyone on the set will know if I rattle this, I know it's not a real bullet despite how it looks. So they did the photo shoot with some dummy rounds. And as I understand it, one of those dummy rounds had, had a lot of years of service as a prop, and the bullet lead portion uh, had come loose from the brass casing because they're just pressed in. It had come loose and lodged in the barrel. Uh, later on, at another time, they went to film with that gun. They hadn't checked the gun after the photography. They hadn't checked the gun before they were going to film. They had let the armorer go home, as I understand it. The prop master had gone home. They added the scene, and there was a prop assistant there. Grabbed the gun. They were going to film the scene. Didn't check the barrel. Didn't make sure it was clear. And that would have been the chain of command of the of the prop person and the AD, both checking that the barrel was unobstructed, and they're only using blanks. Now, when you put a blank behind an actual lead bullet that's lodged in the barrel, you've now created a de facto bullet. And the next step that happened was the one actor that was firing at Brandon Lee was supposed to cheat toward the camera and not actually fire at him. However, he pointed right at him, and when he fired the gun, it, it, it killed him. Oh, oh, so sad. And that was back in 1993, the filming of the movie The Crow. Brandon Lee, of course, was the son of the late Bruce Lee. And recently, Dutch, we know that... Brandon's sister has taken to Twitter after learning of the horrific incident involving actor Alec Baldwin and with cinematographer Helena Hutchins and director Joel Souza. Uh, she responded, and we have that tweet. She wrote, uh, quote, our hearts go out to the family of Helena Hutchins and to Joel Souza and all involved in the incident on Rust. No one should ever be killed by a gun on a film set, period. Um, you know, and and she's she's certainly right. I mean, and you certainly know that. And um, I think the important point you were just making was that, you know, day in and day out, this is safely done. We just don't hear about it when it's being done properly. But when tragedy like this occurs, then we're analyzing every single bit of it. Uh, Dutch, it's been so great to to get your insight and expertise. Uh, before we let you go, is there anything you think that's really important for the public to know about this that we haven't asked you or you haven't been asked in, um, in the course of speaking to you know various members of the media? Well, I'll, I'll offer this. Uh, the actor that gets the Academy Award is the one that gives it their all. And in order to give it their all, they need to know that they're playing in a safe space. And that's our job. We, we create the world in which they inhabit the character. We build the sets. We create, we have the props, the guns, every element there so that they can be completely immersed in that. 
and and just go, you know, <laughs> all the way to the wall with it. And we're standing at the edges to just make sure that they're safe. And when an actor takes a gun from me, they are assured that this is safe. And I've told them where to point. And these are blanks. And nobody's going to get hurt if we all do it, as we've talked about. And when an actor like Alec Baldwin, uh, over that many years, has to build confidence in a crew that they're doing the right thing. And that chain of events that happened, again, just like Brandon Lee, any one of the things that had changed in that course of events would have this wouldn't have happened if there wasn't live rounds on the set, if it wasn't uh, pointed at the camera person, if the AD hadn't grabbed the gun, if the AD hadn't grabbed it and said that it was a cold gun, which means it was empty, and he hadn't, he clearly hadn't checked it. Um, we're there to create an environment in which they can play freely and really be in it, and and that's what we pride ourselves in. That's why our our entertainment looks so real and looks so good. And again, Hollywood has a tremendous, tremendous safety record. We go through testing. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, take firearm safety courses. And there's only some people, only a handful of people in Hollywood that do handle the guns, and that's what we specialize in. Absolutely, as a prop master and an armor, you have a very important job behind the scenes. And it was really great to hear about all that you do. Dutch Merrick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Julie, for having me. Take good care. We're going to squeeze in a break now. When we come back, we will play you newly released audio from 911 calls made by disgraced lawyer Alex Murdoch following the September 4th shooting incident. Plus, why one passerby thought it looked like a setup. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. We continue following the tragic case involving actor Alec Baldwin with the accidental shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins and uh, the director on the film, Joel Souza, the film Rust being filmed in New Mexico. And we were just speaking with a prop master, armorer, Dutch Merrick, um, who is an expert in his field and talking about safety on movie sets. Um, and as the sheriff's office there in Santa Fe continues investigating this and trying to get to the bottom of, of uh, how this incident occurred, I, I want to dive in and analyze with our guest on the program, former District Attorney George Brockler, what criminal charges, if any, anyone could possibly be facing and all this. Um, so, George, I know, and we're totally acknowledging we don't know all of the facts yet, right, as this investigation is still in the right. very, very early stages. Um, we know that Alec Baldwin was handled, a, uh, was handed, excuse me, a gun that was said to be a cold gun, uh, indicating that it contained blanks when, in fact, it contained a, a live round um, of ammunition. We know one person killed, one recovering today. Um, Tell me, uh, what we know so far, what is jumping out at you in terms of whether or not anyone involved in this project could face any kind of criminal responsibility, potentially? It's a tough one because of how many hands the, the firearm was passed through before it got to Alec Baldwin. Now, listen, for anyone that's watched Murder, She Wrote or Matlock or any of those other things, you can envision a circumstance where somebody held a grudge against the studio, against an actor put a live round in there uh, hoping something would happen, then we're talking about murder. But if everything is the way it seems right now, it seems to me the largest charge available under the Colorado, I'm sorry, the California Penal Code would be involuntary manslaughter, which would be like a criminally negligent homicide in the state of Colorado. And it's premised on criminal negligence. Um, I, I think that that's also going to be a tough pull, given the statements we've already heard that other people handed him the gun and told him that it was safe or words to that effect. But we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by that interview you had, Julie. I thought that was so informative. And that's got to be part of the DA's investigation at this point is to understand what Alec Baldwin knew, what he'd been trained on, what he believed. All of those things go into what's going on in his mind at the time he makes the decision. And these are two big decisions. He pointed a gun at another human being and he pulled the trigger, even if he thought it was safe or had a blank. That's crazy. Anybody that's ever handled, handled firearms or been through any training knows those two things don't ever happen unless you intend to hurt the other person. You just don't do it. So probably in, involuntary manslaughter is likely the biggest charge being considered. 
Uh, but I also think that independent of that, this case is likely going to result in a lawsuit and and civil negligence, very different than criminal negligence. If you ask me to guess right now, I'd say there will be a truckload of money backed up to whoever sues, probably the husband's house and dumped there. And we'll never hear anything more about the details of this unless it comes out of that criminal investigation. Right. A really great analysis you just gave us, George. Uh, definitely a flurry of civil suits. Um, but you know, as far as what's criminal, uh, as you said, we need more facts. Um, the one factual scenario, uh, and again, this is just for the sake of our analysis you put forth, um, that would require intent, intent to murder. Let's let's analyze that a little bit more because I was asked a question about this, and I think it's a good um, thing to work through and, and talk through on the program. If someone did intentionally bring that live round on the set intending to have it make its way into one of those guns uh, so others who were intending to use them safely wouldn't have any idea. Um, and someone like Alec Baldwin just unwittingly, you know, use that gun. Um, who's going to get the murder charge? Yeah, the person that put the live round in there. And, and you know, you don't have to read too much fiction to put yourself in the position of deciding that maybe the person who handed that firearm to Baldwin knows what that upcoming scene is knows who he's going to point that gun at and shoots it, and they want that person to be injured or killed. But it doesn't happen because for whatever reason, Alec Baldwin instead points it at a crew member and shoots and kills them. Despite the fact that the person who put the live round in there may have intended the death of someone else and it turned into a different scenario, that transferred intent still applies. And they will be good for the murder of the cinematographer and the injury to the director, just as if they were their intended targets. I appreciate that. So it doesn't matter who they were intending to hurt with that gun or kill with that gun, uh, whoever was hurt or killed, if it was intentionally introduced into the scenario by someone, they've got the murder charge. That's right. uh, um, George, this is this is really, really helpful analysis. I have more questions for you. I want to play a clip from one of the friends of the woman who was killed on the set, the cinematographer, Helena Hutchins. Uh, two of her friends were kind enough to join us on Court TV mm -hmm. Live on Friday. They spoke with anchor Ted Rollins. Let's take a listen. She was a really incredible friend and a person that just is um, a massive loss to this community because she was just on the cusp of her career. And, um, you know, I'm an artist, and she worked with me on just almost any project that was creative. She was so truly creative. And in addition to being just a brilliant DP, of which, you know, there's very few women who are at this level achieving such a height. And um, we were both just so excited about her path. So, um you know, it's just crushing because she's also a friend and she's a mom. Oh, it's so sad. Um, you know, our hearts break for all of her loved ones. I know your heart does, George. And as as we're interviewing um, people who knew her on Court TV and they're sharing the stories, uh, to your point you made a moment ago, uh, surely the sheriff's department is interviewing everybody who was on that set, are they not? And deciding, you made a great point about who was supposed to be where if somebody did intentionally introduce that live round into this picture. Um, how important is it for the sheriff's office to find out what every single person there knows about what was supposed to happen and what did actually happen? Yeah, it's critical. I mean, they need to get to everybody yesterday mm -hmm. and isolate them so that they don't have the ability to even innocently exchange their memories of what took place ahead of time. The fact that some of this information is starting to leak out is a bit concerning, as you can imagine. I imagine the studio itself is trying to downplay uh, what had taken place as much as you can under these horrible circumstances, but they really need to get a, a handle on who all was there, who all touched and should have touched that weapon, the firearms, and, and ultimately get to who is responsible for this. And it could be that at the end of the day, they conclude this horrible tragedy just doesn't amount to the level of a crime. But they can't know that until they've talked to everyone, as you've suggested. George Brockler, great analysis from you, as always. Thank you so much. We're going to squeeze in a break.